Okay, so, so today's speaker is a uh, professor, uh, Frank Francois Gerutard uh, from uh, University of Strasbourg, and uh, he will uh, explain us a lot about the uh, core complex actions, and uh, so he will explain uh, from the beginning of um, these. Uh, uh, beginning with lots of uh, concepts new to the students. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. I uh, I will try to do my best today to cover the first two uh, halves of the of the program here. So some background on on Gromov of hyperbolicity and um, and what we mean by convex co-compact actions in the in the classical sense, so then that would be the actions on, on the hyperbolic plane, hyperbolic space, or more generally, um, spaces with a strict negative curvature property. Uh, and also in a slightly more novel sense, where you, you look at actions on the symmetric space, uh, sorry, on, on projective space, PN. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to interrupt me as many times as possible. It's uh, I know it's difficult in seminars and maybe even more difficult on Zoom, but please feel free to to interrupt if anything is a uh, is a miss. I um, I won't be able to provide much in the way of proofs today. There will be um, uh, especially in the first part. I will have to cover the the main facts. And sort of give it, rely more on examples than on on, on proofs properly. Um, and uh, okay, and hopefully next week we'll we'll treat the uh, the uh, the Anosov side of things. All right, so um, I am going to talk about Gromov hyperbolicity for a while. We. Uh, so Gromov hyperbolicity is a property of metric spaces that Gromov uh, introduced in uh, in the 1980s in order to synthesize a number of uh, constructions that that people had had uh, uh, been working with, uh, especially in the context of geometry of groups. So here's uh, here's the definition: we are going to work with metric spaces X D that will always be geodesic and complete. So geodesic means between any two points x and y, you can find a, ge a, a geodesic segment. So that's a, a parametrization of a segment, such <clears throat> such that uh, the distance. So for for every real number t between zero and one, you can come up with a point z t, whose distance to x is exactly t times the distance to uh, to y and whose distance to y is exactly one minus t times the distance x y. Uh, so this is geodesic in the in the usual sense, and and complete just means that Cauchy sequences converge. So uh, if you are familiar with with uh, Cauchy sequences, you don't need to to read this. But basically, if you have points that become closer and closer as, as you take them further and further in a in a, in a sequence, um, and then there is a well defined limit. Okay, so Gromov's definition is, the, is as follows. He says, uh, take, take XD such a geodesic space, and it's going to be delta hyperbolic for delta a, a number, I guess, uh, positive or zero, zero is allowed, uh, with respect to a base point O, if and only if, um, whenever you compute well, if you if you define this product uh, x y seen from O, what is x y seen from O? It's the sum of O x plus O y minus x y. So if you think of this as a as a tripod, it's like you, you're 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 uh, summing this plus that, and then cancelling out the, the the stuff above. So so in a in a tripod, it would be twice the the length of the on the foot. Take that multiplied by a half, and you require that it, it satisfies for every triple x, y, and z. The, the product f, x, y seen from O is at least the minimum of x, z seen from O and y, z seen from O, uh, minus a tolerance delta. 
So the fundamental example to have in mind here is that of trees. So what happens in a, in a metric tree? And then, <clears throat> as we said, uh, the product x, y seen from O, for example, is essentially the length of the path from O to, to the geodesic x, y. Right. So what, what this is saying is that if you take x, z, and z, y, then at least one of those two, in this case z, y, comes as close to O as, uh, as does x, y. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, so trees are zero hyperbolic in this sense. And in fact, every uh, zero hyperbolic geodesic metric space is a tree. So uh, the, ge the geometric properties, I want to say, uh, of, of delta hyperbolic spaces that we're going to, to uh, study are all classifications of the geom geometry of trees. Um, all right. So, just to to provide some visual intuition, if you are if you are have spent your life in Euclidean space, then this is what a segment looks like. This is what a triangle looks like. This is what a polygon looks like. In a tree, well, a segment is a segment. A triangle is the union of all the paths between three points. You could also call it the convex hull of three points. Polygon is the convex hull of many points. So in a tree, it looks like a subtree. And in, in a delta hyperbolic space, well, it's going to look like um, a triangle is going to look almost like a tripod. It's a tripod plus some tolerance, some, some stuff of size roughly delta. And same thing for a polygon. There, as the number of, um, as the number of vertices increases, I may have to, to gradually increase the size of the tolerance. But if I only uh, care about polygons of a of a given order, then there is a uniform uh, sense in which polygons are approximated by uh, trees. So here's a property that Gromov proves in the, in his uh, in his uh, original paper. So his original paper from the eighties is like one hundred and fifty pages long. And this shows up around page uh, more than 100. He, he does a lot of other things before, but he proves thinness of hyperbolic triangles. Uh, so what does it mean for triangles to be thin? Uh, it means exactly the content of this proposition. So when you have a triangle in a, in a delta hyperbolic space with side lengths A, B, and C, and you take two points on the sides A and B that are the same distance from the common vertex. And this distance is at most that value, A plus B minus C over two. So if you think, uh, if you think what this means, it's, um, it's what you would have in a tripod, right? In a tripod, you would have A plus B minus C over two. Uh, a plus C minus B over two and B plus C minus A over two. If these are the lengths of the legs of the tripod, then the uh, they add up together to A, to B, uh, and to C. So if X and Y are closer than, than, than that to the common endpoint, then the, the distance between them should be at most, or will be at most two delta. We can prove that, uh, in fact, this is a characterization. So if you have, if you have uh, something delta hyperbolic, all the triangles are two delta thin. And almost conversely, if you have something where triangles are delta thin, then you're two delta hyperbolic. So give or take this factor of two, you can, you can also use this, this uh, thinness of triangles as a definition of, of hyperbolicity. And maybe that has become a bit more uh, more popular in the time since. Um, so here's a more general sense in which finite sets, not just not just triples of points, but finite, any finite sets, look coarsely like trees. So proposition, if you take in a delta hyperbolic space X, a subset P of cardinality at most two to the K plus two, 
then there is a metric tree uh, and a map from p to the to the tree so I, should, I could say to the to the le to the leaves of the metric tree such that so <coughs> the distance between two uh, image points is at most the distance between the points so the the, the, the map is um, contracting or non-expanding and uh, it's contracting by at most a uniform additive amount so uh, if you if you look at this the, the the difference between the lower bound and the and the upper bound is just a multiple of delta uh, depending on k the the log of the cardinality of the, of the finite set so the case um, the case k equals one I guess was the was the triangle so here's uh, again to give some visual context uh, here's the the set p made of four points and here's the tree that it contracts to and in general if you have many many vertices then the the approximating tree or the the order of error to which you can approximate by a tree is on the order of the logarithm of the of the number of vertices so if you take uh if you and this logarithm should remind you of what happens in a in a in the hyperbolic plane. So in the hyperbolic plane, you're going to have uh, a ball of radius n as roughly uh, or a circle of radius n has roughly e to the n circumference. And so, so, so this. Uh, if I have on the order of e to the n vertices, then the the edges are going to come in uh, roughly to within distance n from the center. So here's an idea of how um, Gromov goes about proving this. He has, a, he has a lot of sort of heavy machinery in his paper, but, but I think we can I can give the idea here. He um, he says, okay, let's choose a base point O in the in the space X and construct an approximation of the whole space X. Uh, so how do you do that? It's a it's a tree T sub X that's constructed from uh, uh, an infinite union of abstract segments O X, so X ranges over all points uh, of the of the space. For each X in the space, you construct a segment O X that has the correct length, the length uh, distance uh, of O X in X, and then so, so that would give you a giant star, right? A, a, a point O and many 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 segments, one for each point in the in the space X. And then you merge certain certain um, subsegments of these segments, namely, when a, as long as two segments stay delta close, you merge them. So that will define a tree for you. And then he can argue that the the distances measured in this tree are close to the distances measured in the in the geodesic, geodesic space X. Um, and in a tree, of course, in a tree. Uh, this is true with with error zero because you, you're starting from the tree. Okay, so this is the spirit of uh, of Gromov's argument. I am um, now going to give a number of examples of uh, delta hyperbolic spaces. So if you have a space of finite diameter. Uh, that's hyperbolic because you you just take delta bigger than the than the diameter and all the inequalities are automatically true. Finite diameter is boring. If you have infinite diameter but you're a tree, then you're you're good. You're zero hyperbolic, as mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> then there is the. Um, and there is the uh, the motivating example of hyperbolic spaces. So H2 or Hn uh, 
in which triangles look like well in the in the conformal model of the of uh, h2 triangles look uh look like the thing and rule here and uniform neighborhoods of the of the edges look like bananas right and so the uniform and the hyperbolicity property says that one edge stays within the union of the two bananas and the, and the other edge now this uh, i people draw this picture a lot uh, and you kind of don't see anything because, because of the because of the way the bananas are shaped the way you should think of uh, hyperbolic triangles in this context is really a a small a thick part that is that is a bounded diameter diameter delta and then uh, very long skinny spikes coming out this is this is truer to the to the intrinsic metric of the of the hyperbolic triangle here in the sense that these spikes here have infinite length and the point out here is at, is at infinite distance and you can in, there exist in fact estimates that say how fast the the two geodesics uh, come close together they come they, they come the, the distance between them shrinks exponentially as I, as I go out linearly okay so more more generally uh, if you have a complete simply connected Riemannian manifold with curvature uh, bounded above by a negative number, which is also called a Adamar manifold of negative curvature. And the same, the, the same um, estimates apply up to a up to a power of kappa, and you can say that you're uh, delta hyperbolic. Now here are some uh, combinatorial examples. If you take a a simplicial triangulation of the plane making sure that the the number of um, triangles coming into every vertex is at least is bigger than six so at least seven but here i try to draw uh, it's, it's it's kind of challenging i try to draw as many triangles as i could fitting always seven triangles uh, around every every vertex and uh, the growth rate of the the number of triangles within within the, distance and within radius r is, is exponential uh, so this this is a <clears throat> this is a cousin of the of the h2 example in the sense that well you can find triangles with angles uh, uh, 2 pi over 7 in the hyperbolic plane and, and tile the hyperbolic plane with them or you can think of this as euclidean triangles um, and the negative curvature is concentrated in the vertices. So you have more than two pi total angle around every vertex. And this accumulates over, over large balls. Okay, so these last two examples, the, the curvature example, negative curvature example, and the, the combinatorial um, triangulation example have a flavor in common, which is uh, you check hyperbolicity locally, right? You check curvature locally, that's an infinitesimal property. And you can also check this, uh, th these numbers, having at least seven neighbors, uh, completely locally. Well, you give a different metric, right? So you, you give a metric on uh, each edge to be length one, right? Is that the... Right, so there, there are, yeah, they are um, implicitly here. Uh, I, I want to make the the triangles of this simplicial triangulation uh, equilateral triangles of the plane. So I, I want to think of this surface as uh, locally Euclidean, but with singularities of angle bigger than two pi. Uh, but but a close cousin again, a close cousin of this situation is just to to take equilateral triangles of the hyperbolic plane, and and then you can add uniform curvature. Now the point, yeah, the point is that in in all of these cases you check hyperbolicity locally. It's, it's a it's a local property at every vertex. Um, 
And that will be a common theme, a recurring theme, uh, checking things locally in this uh, in this series of, uh, of uh, results. So I want to mention uh, the following important uh, result that, that was historically a big motivation. If you have a finitely generated group G and it's delta hyperbolics, uh, then many good properties then should uh, follow. So what does it mean to be delta hyperbolic for a group? Well, I need to construct a space for this group. So the space will be just the graph, the Cayley graph, V, G, E, G, V vertex set, E edge set. The vertex set is just G. There's one point for every, uh, one, one vertex for every element, element of G. And the edge set is just that you, com you connect G with G, S, when S is a generator. So you take S, a generating set of G, and then whenever you, you see an element, you connect it to all its, uh, to, to its, finitely its finitely many neighbors, G, S. So if that is delta hyperbolic, then G is kind of nice. G has, uh, you, can, you can construct algorithms with bounds on, on the running time uh, for problems like checking whether to, whether a given word in the generators S is uh, is the trivial element, or checking whether two, um, two words define conjugated elements. And all of this, so, so I could, <clears throat> I could mention more things. There's also, um, uh, normal forms. There is up to some up to a finite number of choices. There will be a canonical way of writing down um, uh, any element in the generators S, and also uh, I guess if you've heard about automata, automatic structures. A sort of a, a local algorithm for selecting the alphabetically smallest representative of every word. That's that's something you can do locally again. Um, all right. So what are <clears throat> again? This is historically the main uh, the main uh, thrust, the, the main thing that uh, that Gromov and Rips and uh, and other people had in mind studying groups. So what are some examples of groups that are hyperbolic in this sense? And the first example is free groups. A free group, or, okay, maybe I should have started like before with the finite groups, those are hyperbolic, for the same <clears throat> reason as finite diameter spaces. And also a, a group like Z is, uh, is hyperbolic. But the first um, uh, genuine example, or interestingly, interesting example would be free groups. Uh, so what's the what's a free group? It's just a group of all words that you can write in A and B with no other simplification rules than, than the, knowing that A A inverse is one and B B inverse is one. So I'd like to emphasize here. Uh, well, the Cayley graph in this case is a tree, and I'd like to emphasize. Uh, it took me a while uh, while I was learning the subject to understand why it's important to distinguish between uh, G, S. Right? G and G, S are connected by an edge. Distinguishing between, distinguishing between G, S and S, G. So if you... What happens in this, uh, in this tree is that if you start from one, then you go to A, then you go to A, B, Right, you have, you have added a, a generator B, plays the role of S to the right. Then you could go to A, B, A, and so on. As you add a letter, you always, uh, uh, I mean, as you move in the tree to neighbors, you always add letters to the right of the word. And on the other hand, multiplying on the left, well, multiplying on the left is, a, is an operation that preserves edges, right? Because if you have W connected to WS, then you can multiply the whole thing on the left by, by a group element G, and that will give you GW connected to GWS, right? Because GWS can be seen like this, GW times S, so there's an edge, or it can be seen like that. Um, 
g of w s. So it's the image of the of the other edge. So so the edge edge structure is is preserved by multiplication on the left. However, multiplication on the left will uh, shift these points by one. If, if I multiply by a, then the, the points on the axis of a will be shifted by one. Each goes to the next. But a point like like this one multiplied by a goes up here, then it goes here, then goes here, right? So multiplying by a moves these points by three. And if I take the point up here, then multiplying by a takes it to one, two, three, four, five. And then multiplying by a again goes to one, two, three, four, five. Right, so again, multiplying on the left acts on the whole space, while multiplying on the right it can be seen as uh, instructions for how to move in the space. Um, this will be a theme in 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 one of the developments uh, next week, I guess. Um, another big example, which was historically a precursor to the to the theory of hyperbolicity is what is called small cancellation groups. So what is a small cancellation group? Well, <clears throat> you, you know groups defined by generators and relators. Letters, S1, Sn, and you give yourself a, a number of words, W1 to Wk, each is a, each is a, a sequence of, uh, of uh, generators, and you demand that, that these be one. Now, if you have such a presentation, but the relators are kind of unrelated. They are unrelated to one another in the sense that they never have much in common. If you have a subword, so here I wrote, can you see all the tiny dots? Each tiny dot in the in the tiny orange dot along an edge represents a letter, uh, SI. So the, the small cancellation property says that whenever you have a, a generator, Sorry, a relator WJ, and it has a common subword with a generate. Sorry, with another relator WJ prime. And then this common relator is shorter than a sixth, shorter than one sixth uh, of the of the length of WJ. Uh, so in this example, I made sure everything was exactly one seventh, which is less than a sixth. Then. Um, your group is in fact world hyperbolic. So <clears throat> one uh, one way of seeing this is to, I guess that's a third characterization of world hyperbolicity, is that for any loop, uh, the area of the loop is at most on the order of the length of the loop. And just like uh, uh, in, in the hyperbolic plane, for example, you have a, a ball of radius r, then its perimeter is exponential in r, and its area is also exponential in r. And the, the area and the perimeter and the, and the length grow at the same rate, unlike in the... In, so they grow fast, they grow exponentially, but they grow at the same rate. Different from what you have in, uh, in, the, in the Euclidean plane, for example. The perimeter grows linearly and the area grows quadratically. So, right. So, so the, this property of um, of uh, this is some sometimes called the uh, isoperimetric inequality. Isometric, isoper or isoperimetric properties of, of uh, hyperbolic groups. Uh, those follow naturally from the from the the bound one sixth here, and you can sort of convince yourself that one sixth, if they were, were allowed to share one sixth of their uh, of their perimeter, and the, these cells uh, embedded in the in the KD graph then you could just barely tile the Euclidean plane with hexagons. But if you, if you enforce less than a sixth, then, then you have, you have this uh, exponential growth that needs to take place. So, um, okay, one particular instance of that would be surface groups. If you have 
a, a, a surface of genus at least two, also known as a hyperbolic surface, closed surface. Then a presentation <coughs> of its fundamental group can be given as the, you know, you, you need two G generators and the product of commutators is one. And that is a, that is a small cancellation presentation of the, of the group. So it's, <coughs> it's, um, you do have to to consider the possibility of j being equal to j prime, so so subwords that occur twice inside the same relator W j, but here nothing occurs twice. Every every generator appears exactly once and once with its uh, with the negative power. All right, so I'll. Um, I'll finish this uh, overview of, of uh, delta hyperbolic spaces by saying that the things, some of the things that we use all the time. Um, one important property, which is called the Morse, the Morse property, is that in a, in a delta hyperbolic space, if you have a quasi geodesic, then it's it's uh, within bounded distance of an actual a true geodesic, and you can make all of this uniform. So what does this mean? A C C quasi geodesic, lowercase C uppercase C, in a metric space X, is a continuous path that is uh, well. It's not, it's not an isometry, uh, but it but almost. So the, the distance in x uh, between x at time s and x at time t is estimated by two affine functions of, uh, uh, of the difference t minus s. I guess I should have said low case c is uh, at least 1, and this one is maybe at least 0. Right, so that's a very standard uh, uh, relationship that sh shows up all the time. And proposition for all uh, c bigger than one, big c bigger than zero, and delta of delta hyperbolicity, you can find an explicit constant k such that any cc and any quasi geodesic with these constants in a delta hyperbolic space is. At most distance k on all of its length from a true geodesic uh, with the same endpoints. So the um, one way to, of illustrating this would be to say, if you are in the hyperbolic plane and well, if you want to travel while staying far from the geodesic with the same endpoints that has a cost. Uh, in fact, you can exactly compute the cost. It says that if you have uh, a length L here and height, height H here, then the, the, the cost of staying outside the, outside the H uniform neighborhood is uh, cosh. H times n. So there's a, an exponential cost to uh, to not following the the geodesic, similar to how the the perimeter of a of a ball of radius r is exponential in r. It's uh, sinh r in fact, times two pi. Um, all right. So that's one thing. And another, okay, another fundamental object in the context of uh, of delta hyperbolic spaces is the um, the ideal boundary. So when you have a delta hyperbolic space X, you automatically have a a topological space bound. Oh, we call this ideal boundary of X or boundary at infinity of X, which is it does not come exactly with a natural metric, but with a, a class of metrics that are all older equivalent to one another. So to out of cautiousness, we just call it metrizable. 
um, it's defined as the, the equivalent classes of infinite quasi geodesic or infinite geodesics. We just saw that they are the same. Uh, that stay a bounded distance apart from each other. So here is a ray in the here's a base point. I show the base point and I'll say in a moment what it's for. Here's a ray through the base point in the in uh, in X. Here's another ray that stays a bounded distance from it. And we say that that the the, the class of all those rays and also the quasi-geodesics that, that follow it. Uh, and stay around the distance. This whole class determines a, an abstract point that we put here at infinity xi. And for a different ray, it's eta. And when, okay, so this is just a set theoretic definition of the, of the boundary at infinity, but I want to put a, topo a topology on it. So when do I say that uh, such a limit point xi is close to another limit point eta? Well, I take escaping points xn that goes to go to x and yn that go to eta, and I compute this uh, thing that we defined at the beginning. So the the distance from xn to o plus the distance from yn to o minus the distance from xn to yn, and that will converge to a limit, which is essentially how close the the shortest path from xi, xi to eta comes of the base point. Right, so if I take, <clears throat> I take a limit. Maybe maybe I should take a, a, a beam. Sorry. A limit inferior here, just to be safe. Um, a limit of these will define a number, which is essentially again exponential minus uh, this distance. And if I'm careful to put a, a small enough uh, epsilon in front, so I, I think um, I think one over delta should also some some uniform constant divided by delta should should do the trick here. Small number in front, then this will satisfy the triangle inequality. Right? This is just a real number that, that tells me when two points are close. But if I want to be able to pretend this is a distance, a visual distance as measured from O. And I have to make sure it satisfies the triangle inequality. So <clears throat> to ensure that, I, I put a small epsilon in front that will cause everything to sort of shrink towards one. That will make the triangle inequality easier to, to satisfy. Okay. And um, and again, this <clears throat> up to some constants, this defines what you would want it to define in the case of the hyperbolic plane, namely the angle, the visual angle as seen as seen from the base point, the visual angle between. Uh, two ideal limit points. So this is a thing that always exists abstractly in uh, in the world hyperbolic group. And again, here are some examples. For the free group, for the free group, the the boundary at infinity is this Cantor set. Okay, again, I should start maybe with the finite group and boundary at infinity is empty, right? There's, there's no way for, for a ray to escape, escape to infinity. If I do uh, the group Z, which is uh, word hyperbolic, then uh, it has two boundary points, plus infinity, plus infinity and minus infinity. Uh, and the next interesting case is a free group. I claim that its boundary is a counter set. It's the counter set of this tree, that, I mean, the, the, the limit points of this tree, or the escaping rays in this tree that we drew before. As you can see, if you squint, I think I put some some color here for the counter set. You can you can recognize the way that the counter set falls into smaller and smaller patches. Um, <clears throat> so that's the free group. If you take a surface group, then uh, it, it, well, you know that the the its universal cover is a disk, and in fact, the, the boundary at infinity will coincide with the boundary of this disk. So the, the boundary at infinity of a of a surface group is S1. It's S1 topologically, and of course, if I take uh, for if I endow the the surface with a hyperbolic metric, 
then the, the, the self maps of this S1 will preserve a, a projective structure, a, a smooth structure, and in fact, a projective structure. So there are some, there are some uh, uh, things to say about the, the regularity of this, uh, of this S1. Uh, if I take a different, so th this is interesting to know, it's kind of incidentally related to what I'm saying, but if I take a different um, action, and so uh, the surface group of genus G acts on both of these. And in fact, there exists an equivariant um, map between the two the two copies of the hyperbolic plane, and the this map induces a holder. Equivariant map in between the boundaries at infinity. Right? If the so if I have the same group or a conjugate group, then the map is going to be a, a smooth projective uh, transformation, taking the circle to the circle. But in general, it's it loses every. Smoothness, it's holder, and, and in fact, locally, it's not in piecewise smooth, right? It's uh, the exponents are, are bad everywhere. And you can also estimate the, the, these holder exponents in terms of the of the two hyperbolic metrics. Uh, okay, so more generally than that, you can you can do this in dimension n. If you have a compact Riemannian n manifold with negative curvature, then it's bound it's boundary at infinity. Well, the boundary at infinity of its fundamental group is also the boundary at infinity of its universal cover, and that's going to be a sphere of one less dimension. And these these sphere examples are kind of uh, very special, very atypical, and probably if you want a, a general intuition, it's it's best to to stick with the counter set, in the sense that in general, for, for most groups, the boundary at infinity has a has a fractal quality, a fractal behavior. So here I tried to draw what, <clears throat> what you are going to get if you take a free product of two surface groups over a common simple closed curve. Right. So what does that mean? I take this space, I attach it with this space, so two surfaces along uh, that curve. The resulting thing is a well-defined space of which I can take the, the fun fundamental group. And if you think about what the, what the limit set of this fundamental group is, well, it's going to have many circles, one circle for every conjugate of the of each of the factor groups. Um, but uh, circles appear an infinite number of times, right? Here in thick, and drew the first circle, which is the, the limit set of the fundamental group of the first surface. So there are many lifts of, of C1 that appear in it. And for each of these, well, there's a there's a copy of uh, there's a copy of the second surface that, that has the same two endpoints. And then that repeats. So it sort of burgeons off to infinity. And that's that's more of a typical behavior, something very fractal. From the, from the limit set. All right. Um, now, a one last thing I want to say. Next to last thing, that I want to say about uh, hyperbolic spaces in general is that there is a classification of uh, of their isometries uh, in in a dynamical sense. So, if you have a delta hyperbolic space X, then it has at most three types of isometries. I say at most because sometimes one of the types could be empty. Um, and the names are based on, on what we have for, for the hyperbolic plane. So an isometry could be elliptic. That just means that there is a bounded orbit. And if I take uh, 
that point. So if there's one bounded orbit, then of course all the orbits are bounded because you stay within constant distance of the I mean, two orbits stay within constant distance of one another. Uh, so that's elliptic. Parabolic <clears throat> is the situation where uh, there exists an orbit with a single accumulation point. So that does happen in the case of the, the hyperbolic plane, for example. Namely, you, you have a parabolic isometries that send these, uh, these rays to one another, which goes to the next and to the next and to the next. So if you if you think about what uh, the, the orbital behavior of these, uh, you can convince yourself that any point, in fact, goes to the same limit point whether you map whether you iterate forward or, or backward. So that's uh, called parabolic, and the it turns out that the only remaining case, if you're if you're in neither of these two cases, then it turns out that. Uh, the only possibility is that you have two fixed points and you translate by a constant amount on the on the uh, along the geodesic connecting them. So in that case, orbits are quasi-isometric embeddings, unlike unlike here. Right here, if you take an orbit point, then then the distance between uh, gamma minus n x and gamma plus n x is on the order of log n. Whereas here it grows linearly within. Um, okay, so I'll say just a, a few words about a later development um, called relative. I mean, it's all, it's already present in in Gromov's original uh, article, but Bodich studied in in detail uh, and just give the definition. It's called relative hyperbolicity. So <clears throat> you have a group G. In a subgroup H, and there's a sense in which G could be rel could be hyperbolic relative to H. So what you want to say is, let's take the the, the group G, and let's pretend that all the points in the in in an H coset in a copy of H uh, are distance one from one another. So we. It's like we, we insert some extra edges. Well, that's <clears throat> and that's uh, sometimes called weakly relatively hyperbolic. And the correct notion, which I'm only going to illustrate by, by an example below, is that you ask that. And in addition, um, any edge in the resulting graph belongs to only finitely many cycles of a given length. So example, this is sort of designed to cover uh, this type of example where you act on, on the hyperbolic space H3. So H3 is this group um, that has, sorry, is, is this space whose uh, isometry group is isomorphic to PSL2C. And so you, you can you can see its action as um, uh, well the projective action on, on on the Riemann sphere, right? So so a tetrahedron, for example, will be three points here plus a point at infinity, and there's a sense I mean four points in, in the Riemann sphere, and I'm taking one of the four at infinity. And there's a sense in which you can measure the angle, the dihedral angles of this tetrahedron. It's just, it's just the angles of the of the uh, vertical projection, the, this Euclidean this Euclidean triangle. Um, okay, now it's clear that this um, tetrahedron tiles all of H3 by reflection in its faces because the, 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 the angles are submultiples of 2 pi. And so I'm going to, to tile uh, regularly with, with degree 6 at every edge, uh, the whole hyper, all of hyperbolic space. Now, it is not true that the resulting group is uh, delta hyperbolic. It cannot be true because inside this big group, uh, there is a group of reflections in the 
size of this uh, Euclidean triangle, right? If, you, if I take the stabilizer of the point at infinity, I find already a, a, a copy of z squared. Now, if there's a z squared, you cannot possibly be delta hyperbolic. Inside z squared, you don't have this uh, this uh, tripod behavior of triangles. So this group is not delta hyperbolic, but we, we feel very much like saying it's almost hyperbolic or it's hyperbolic up to up to uh, doing some little things uh, with these copies of z squared. So, so we do uh, what Bodic did. We co we connect. Like we take the k -day graph of the of this group, so that's one point for every tetrahedron, and we connect tetrahedron when they are adjacent. And also, we connect all the tetrahedra that share uh, an ideal endpoint. We connect them all to one abstract, one extra abstract point, and we require that the that the the number of loops in the in the corresponding quotient be be bounded in the in the sense uh, in the sense given here. So this turns out to be the to be the correct um, uh, abstraction for generalizing the this cusp. So so this is called a rank two cusp. And more generally, in, in HN, you can always find uh, groups that act with the rank n minus one cusp. OK, I'll stop here for the context on, on the delta hyperbolicity and take a short break. Um, if uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, then uh, please feel free. <laughs>